I was just pointing out to, to some friends that my name Chetan in, in Sanskrit is, it means living or life, but it also has the root of uh, chit, which is consciousness. So I'd have to tell Bruce that it, it really does the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're not denying life by saying that it's consciousness first because it means the same thing. But anyway, um, so okay, so this talk is called Conscious Agent Dynamics. And I'm going to be uh, introducing the interface theory of perception, um, as well as the uh, a thesis of conscious realism. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about how conscious agents invent structure in the world, even if the world doesn't have it. Um, <clears throat> so I have a fair number of slides. And I realize I'm the last uh, speaker of the, this afternoon session, so I could go rambling on, but I'll try not to. Um, so in this talk, one of the things I'm going to show is that evolution by natural selection entails that physicalism is false. Okay, so, um, and I will also then go on to propose a model of conscious process. Um, so what is physicalism? What are physicalist theories? Um, well, the, the primary attitude of physicalism is that perception, our perceptions, are a reconstruction of an objective world. Okay, and that, includes various assumptions. Um, <clears throat> the first is that our perceptions estimate true properties of the physical world. Um, also, evolution guarantees these estimates are accurate. And I'm reliably informed by my uh, perception colleagues, my cognitive science colleagues, that this is, this is the dogma in the science. Uh, the textbooks all say these things. Um, so what that implies, uh, the physicalist implication is that physical objects have causal powers in the world. And in particular, there's a physical object called the brain, uh, which actually causes consciousness. So that's the physicalist point of view. And I, I think I've maybe, uh, a lot of uh, our talks here tend to have a slightly physicalist attitude, but many of them have, have exactly the opposite. So let's explore. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, numerous questions about these assumptions. For example, is perception veridical? Well, I'll just flash uh, color from motion illusion. There are, there, is, there are no blue bands, but we see them, okay? There are lots of illusions of this sort, and I'm just indicating that uh, perception isn't always veridical, but it's suddenly open to question. Um, the other uh, assumption was that natural selection and evolution favor veridical per perceptions. And I'll very quickly run a slightly risque movie for you, which shows that this is not true. This is a famous moose mating mistake where the moose has fallen in love with the wrong thing. So, okay, so we've got taken care of love. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, throughout, you know, uh, big names like Steven Pinker, who in the mind work says that we are organisms, not angels, and our minds are organs, not pipelines to the truth. Our minds evolved by natural selection to solve problems that were life and death matters to our ancestors, not to commune with correctness. So this is a, already questioning the assumption of the veridicality of our perceptions, okay? So what I want to do is to start with an evolutionary theory of perception, um, and uh, I, I will, in the course of this talk, uh, describe four theorems, which are, they're called theorems because they have mathematical proofs. So if you buy the assumptions, they have proven something. Um, and I said, if you buy the assumptions. So <laughs> uh, the first theorem is uh, about interface agents, which uh, dominate under natural selection agents seeking the truth. I'll just run through this quickly. You may not understand everything I'm saying over here uh, initially, but eventually you will. Second theorem says that fitness landscapes that mirror structures in the world are vanishingly unlikely. Okay. The third theorem says that conscious agents, which I will define as I go along, um, impute spatial structure to a world, to the world that they're interacting with, but the world may not have that structure. And uh, so spatial structure, of course, is a geometric structure that we understand. Uh, th there are other kinds of structures which conscious agents can impute, which the world does not necessarily have to have. It just has to be amenable to it. And one of them that I'm going to describe later on, or very briefly, is a probabilistic structure with, without which we can't really do science. All right, we need some way to describe probabilities. Um, <clears throat> so 
Um, so without further ado, the, as far as the first theorem is concerned, let's set it up. Uh, I would say uh, I have a, a, a small uh, typo over here that should be physicalist. Um, well, yeah, OK. So phys physicalist evolutionary theories uh, are those with, in which our perceptions have evolved as veridical representations of uh, the objective world, not just an objective world, but the objective world. Uh, so I'm going to define veridical perceptions as those that are attuned to the structure of the world. We're assuming that the world has an objective structure, and they're attuned to it. OK, the, the, uh, m many of the pictures in this uh, talk are actually stolen from Don, who just walked in, Don Hoffman. Um, and th this is his famous picture of, of, a, of a desktop, <laughs> okay, which I will describe shortly. Um, so his interface evolutionary theory, as distinct from a physicalist evolutionary theory, says that our perceptions have evolved as a user interface between us and an objective world. So the desktop is meant to be a metaphor for the, such a user interface, which you know, we, we take it seriously, but we don't think it's literally what's going on. If I, if I take this thesis and I move it to, well, Don likes to move it to the trash, but um, <laughs> it, it, then it, it, I would, in fact, lose a thesis. But this is not what's actually going on in the innards of the machine. It's the innards of the machine, the objective world, has a completely different set of processes, which bend no resemblance to what's happening on the interface. You may say, there must be some resemblance. Well, there, there, there are some rules by which you translate uh, voltages and, and uh, currents and so on into the interface. But there are lots and lots of there are gazillion different Im implementations of this. So looking at the interface, we can't really say what's actually happening in the innards. Okay? So interface perceptions, as distinct from veridical per perceptions or true perceptions, are attuned only to evolutionary fitness. Okay? So um, in the course of this talk, I'm going to use a number of different mathematical theories uh, in order to make models of perception, cognition, and consciousness. Um, I'm going to be using evolutionary game theory, which is considered to be by physicalists, as well as everybody else, an ontologically neutral theory, which has been called universal Darwinism. And um, it's sort of the gold standard of applying uh, mathematics to evolutionary situations. Um, <clears throat> I'll be using probability theory and Bayesian inference, and I will also be using or talking a little bit about group theory and geometry. So those are the areas of mathematics that will be employed here. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, in order to model perceptual strategies, whether veridical or interface, um, I want to talk about what the structure is. We'll assume that there's a set of world states, which I'm calling the set W, and then there's a set of perceptions or <clears throat> qualia, which, are, which, is, which constitute the perceptual space, X. So there are two sets. <clears throat> and an ideal perceptual strategy then assigns to every world state a unique percept. Okay? I'm just going to flash what is a more general uh, idea of a perceptual strategy, where it gives you a probability on the set of perceptual uh, states that could have been given rise to by a given world state. Okay, but in view of the time I have, I'm not going to go over that in too much detail. It's a slight generalization. Yes, sir? It's like to every world state, a unique perceptual state? Are you saying one to one? That's, I, uh, that, that's I, an ideal strategy, okay. yes. And, and, so, and in the small print, which is actually more important, uh, we're talking about one to many. Okay. Yeah. So, so you did catch that, right? Okay. Uh, but it, you know, just for the sake of simplicity, it's easier if I talk in terms of ideal strategies for, for today. Um, what is fitness? Well, fitness is a very simple idea in, in this context. And it's a, a fitness function is specific to a, the given species, a given, its environment, and a given action class of its actions. So given these, a fitness function assigns to each world state W a positive number called its fitness. So it, in mathematical terms, it's just a function from W into the positive real numbers. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so here's a definition of a veridical or truth strategy. How does it go? Well, first of all, you use Bayes' theorem to estimate for each possible percept X a maximum a posteriori world state that could have given rise 
to that percept. Oops. Well, I said that fast, but I hope everyone got that. I can go back if you need me to. OK, thanks. Let me just pop right back. There we go. So, <clears throat> so for each possible percept, you estimate what is the most likely world state that could have given rise to it. OK? And we'll call that W sub x. It's the world state, W. Um, so, in other words, you know, there's, a, there's uh, a particular percept x, there's a set of world states that could have given rise to it. I'm calling that P inverse of x. The fiber above x is what we're going to call it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, in, in amongst those, there'll be at least one, if not more, maximum a pos uh, posteriori uh, world states. So you collect all these guys, and then after <clears throat> um, having found one, Okay, I just this is just repeating what I just said. Just really quick question: you, You're using differentiable manifold terminology. Do you really have a differentiable manifold? Not necessarily. No, I'm just saying fiber in in a purely algebraic sense. Okay. This is great. Mathematicians always like ask lots of questions. Okay, I, I, I saw that. I saw that. I was very happy when I saw that. <laughs> anyway, and uh, and the whole idea is that he is going to demolish my argument. That's what we're hoping for. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, the, uh, just a flash Bayes formula for those who, who, who want to see it and photograph it. This is the formula as it applies in this ideal perceptual state uh, situation. Okay. So <clears throat> that's what we use in order to compute the maximum a posteriori. Uh, estimate, and then having done so, you choose that percept amongst all these maximum a posteriori ones that maximizes the fitness. Okay, so you compute the fitness for each of these map states, and then you look at the one that one or more that maximizes them. Okay, so that is going to be the strategy that tells you that this is the particular um, x that I'm going to choose. On the other hand, you have interface strategies. So I'm, I'm just going, trying to carefully define the difference between these two strategies, and um, then I'll state the theorem. So for an interface strategy, you first compute the average fitness for, of each fiber over every perceptual state of the perceptual map P. What I mean by that is, again, with the same picture, um, the fitness of the percept x, the average fitness of its fiber, is the average fitness of all the world states that could have given rise to it. So the gray area is meant to again indicate the fiber over x, the guys that, the, the inverse image of x, if you like. Um, so it's the average over the fiber p inverse of x. And this is again uses, this uses Bayes' uh, theorem. Um, and this is the formula that goes for this particular fitness, okay? So you compute the fitness for each of these x's, and sorry about my animation here, but it'll all make sense. So as I said before, you compute the average fitness for each x, and then you choose that percept x naught that maximizes the average fitness of its fiber, okay? So then what we do is, we ask the question, which strategy dominates? And uh, in view of the time, I won't go over the basic theorems in evolutionary game theory that I use here, but of course I can always show them to you later. Um, and we see that, we, we conclude that um, for this world of, and a finite set of, for any world, and a finite set of perceptual states, then over all possible fitness functions and all possible a priori probability measures, which you need in order to do Bayesian analysis, then the probability that an interface perceptual strategy will dominate a vertical strategy evolutionarily is at least given by this quantity. And this quantity, as uh, x is the size of the perceptual space. So as the perceptual space gets richer and richer, the likelihood of, of interface strategies dominating true truth strategies gets bigger and it goes to one. This is very counterintuitive according to the established doctrine, okay? So uh, Don Hoffman suggested this in 2016 and I went ahead and proved it and it then eventually became part of a larger paper um, 
which involves two other people in this room also. Okay, so as the size of the perceptual space increases to infinity, the probability with which the interface strategies dominate veridical strategies goes to one. And this is generically in a priori measures and fitness functions. Now you could say why generically? Well, I will, the question is why not? Give us a principled reason to think of, a, of something which is non-generic and then we can, you know, we can say different, you have different conclusions. But the implication of this is that our physical vocabulary, which, you know, ascribes uh, reality to an objective world, is an, as an extension of our perceptual predicate vocabulary, is the wrong vocabulary for the causal structure of the world. So that's one conclusion that we can make from this theorem. Um, a few uh, people would object to the domination theorem say, by saying things like, don't fitness functions correspond to the truth? I mean, aren't they homomorphic? to the objective structure, I mean, don't they reflect or mirror the objective structure of the world? And uh, the answer to that is theorem number two, which says that the set of fitness functions that represent any, say, order structure, so if the, if the world has an order structure, the world's um, states are ordered. For example, um, you could have world states that describe the amount of moisture or the amount of salt for an organism that needs these things, okay? Um, but whatever it is, if you have an order structure in the world, the, the set of fitness functions um, that respect that order structure, that are homomorphic to it, that are monotonic with respect to it, uh, compared with the collection of all possible functions that in fact achieve maximum fitness for some world state, goes to zero as the size of the world increases to infinity. Does that include you know, partial order? This is a total. This is a total order, and I. This is just the beginning of a program that we're on, um, where we would like to uh, very much like to think about partial orders. We'd like to think about lattices, because right. lattices actually describe things like continuous functions and 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 topologies. We'd like. So uh, I mentioned topo order, to, to, topologies, algebras like sigma algebras. Which of course, if you have finite situations, just algebra. But any kind of structure. Um, the, the conjecture is that, that the, the set of fitness functions that respect that structure is minuscule, okay? So, which means that I have to now start study category theory, so I don't have to go through each one of these individually. So that's the next thing. <laughs> so, um, fitness is species specific, and species are manifold uh, in the universe. We only found one so far, but that's only because we merely, we've merely seen 1,700 exoplanets. That's nothing, as we just heard, okay? I mean, it's only because that's how far we can see. There are probably billions of them, right? Anyway, so I wanted to make, uh, sort of uh, knock off the mathematics for a moment and mention Bertrand Russell's um, uh, statement that thus it would seem that wherever we infer from perceptions, it is only structure that we can validly infer. Now, Russell was a physicalist, as were, you know most people in this field at that time, and but I think he's absolutely right. It's just it's not the structure of the world. It's so it re really reflects the structure of our own perceptions, and the fact that somehow the world is amenable to allowing us those perceptions whatever that means, and we, we can't say, really. Um, another, an objection, another objection to the domination theorem is that there is consistent agreement on things like 3D shapes, textures, etc. How can you say that these are fictions of our interface? Because that's what we're saying. Um, well, there's a theorem I'm going to be mentioning uh, soon, which says that in spite of the fact that these are very strong intuitions, they are dead false, okay? So the, theorem is, the remaining two theorems say that an agent can see space or probabilities as properties of the world, whether the world actually has those structures or not. Okay, so two more quotes. Thomas Huxley, this is a famous quote that many of you have probably seen before, that how is it that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as a result of irritating nervous tissue? I like that. Is, is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the jinn when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. Um, I don't know if biologists can say anything more than this today. I don't know, where's Bruce? If you look at the work of Dale Purpose. 
Pardon? Duke, Dale Purvis at Duke University. He's done a lot of work on perception as a, as a of the probability of getting it right for the purpose of enhancing your your survival and procreation so versus which is true. I mean, he's. Well, we should definitely incorporate this. Yeah, he's a pal of he's a pal of okay. he's a pal of Don's. Okay, <laughs> great, thanks. Um, Galileo, great physicalist, made this statement. He said, I think that taste, odors, colors, and so on reside in consciousness. Hence, if the living creature were removed, all these qualities would be wiped away. But then he goes on in other parts of it to talk about how there are certain other aspects which are in physical reality. Right? He's more of that sort, right? But I, he, if he had stuck to this... Yeah, I know. He, there's the scientific method which leads to these things, but then there's things science can't even talk about. I see. Right. But he acknowledged their existence. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm sure. Well, what we're saying is that Galileo was, you know, on the right <laughs> path. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so here comes the interface theory. Um, so the, the idea is that, that space-time, as we experience it, is akin to our desktop. It's, this is a metaphor. Um, physical objects are akin to icons on that desktop. Okay? And then icons seem to interact with each other via physical law. They, they have a lawful interaction. And, uh, but this is happening on a desktop. So physical causality is therefore a fiction. Okay? And, um, so you might argue, as has been said yesterday, for example, you know, should I jump in front of the truck uh, if it's all an illusion? Well, we're not quite saying that it's an illusion. A desktop is not an illusion. I, I don't think this is an illusion. I'm actually using it. I mean, it, maybe it is. Maybe I, you know, I'm just saying that this is a desktop. <laughs> it's an interface. My interface is not, an, is not something that I, I should um, uh, take literally but I will take it seriously, uh, quoting Don. Okay, would I step, would the icon of me step in front of the icon of a train? I don't think so, unless it's stationary. I've done that a lot, <laughs> crossing tracks in India, you often had to do that in the old, in the old days. Okay, so, <laughs> um, if evolution favors interfaces as perceptual strategies, and physical entities such as space are constructions in a species-dependent mind, then it invites us to start anew in developing a model of consciousness. And I'm using the word model here rather than theory, okay? As pointed out by Chris Fields earlier on. Um, so we want to describe how consciousness interacts with the world and gives rise to this physics that happens on our interface, okay? So a conscious inter agent interacts with this world. I, we're not saying there's no world. There must be something that we're interacting with, and we're going to propose what that is in a moment. But first of all, what is an agent? Okay. So paring it down to the bare minimum of what a conscious agent could do or be, um, we describe it as having uh, experiences. Okay. Having had an experience, it makes decisions to act, and then it acts on a world, and then it receives perceptions from the world, which are again experiences, okay? So to uh, symbolize this, to describe those as the world W, uh, space of perceptions X, as we were saying before, and the space of actions G, okay? And for those of you who are uh, mathematicians, G is not meant to be a group, but is kind of like one, because it acts. Okay, it's an actor, but it's not necessarily a group, and that's very important what comes on later. So there's a perceptual map, which I've already described before, from the world to perceptions. There's a decision map, which based on perceptions will make decisions about actions. And then there's an action map, which having made a decision about what action you're gonna do, it will affect the world in some way. Okay, and really this lower part of the conscious, well, the part of the conscious agent minus that is what the agent knows. Okay, that's called a reduced conscious agent. Okay, so uh, in this model, there's also N, which is a counter. Every time something, every time it, say, D acts, we update N by one. So it's just a counter of uh, interactions. Okay, so 10 minutes, all right.
Is it less than 10 or is it just? Oh, the person who's with the, with the, oh, you're, you're, okay, good. Okay, I think I should be able to do it by then. So it's a, a conscious agent is a seven tuple, okay? Just like Turing machines, we're defining conscious agents. And um, uh, more generally, I should point out that we are assuming that these are actually probability spaces, okay? or at least measurable spaces on which you can put probabilities. And the n, of course, is some integer. And these, these mappings are actually Markov kernels. Okay, So that allows for dispersion. It allows for probabilities to be discussed. So now I'm just going to flash through what kinds of kernels they are very rapidly, because people who will understand it will understand it, and the, the others shouldn't be bothered. Uh, so again, that's what a conscious agent is. It's a seven tuple which allows for probabilistic behavior. Okay, um, and here's the conscious agent thesis, which is in parallel with the Turing thesis that every conscious entity and its activity can be modeled by a co by conscious agents. I mean, there may be much richer structure, but this is the bare minimum structure of every conscious agent. That's our thesis. It's falsifiable. If we can find a conscious uh, activity or conscious process that doesn't, is not describable this way, then, then we go to plan B. <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, I want to talk about that theorem about space and how conscious agents can invent space. And I just want to point out for uh, the non-mathematicians what space is really meant to be in, in this context of non-physicists. Uh, it's basically a set of points like in this room, determined by a fixed number of para parameters, which in, in this room is three, um, uh, with a metric which allows you to measure distances and so forth. Um, <clears throat> or space-time would have four parameters. Uh, different spaces can have different numbers of parameters, and the manifolds, as, as he was mentioning earlier. And there's a group that acts on this space. I just want to think of it in this term. Like the Euclidean group acts on, on the space of the three-dimensional space. In space, space. You're not necessarily really implying a vector space. I mean, you know, you can talk about having a metric, but we're not necessarily talking about. Not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, but there is a group action. It, there's there's a there's a faithful transitive group action on it, and then that group is then called the symmetry group of the space. SL3, Sorry. SL three one, for instance, for. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. So so it's a very general idea. Okay, so given, in, in fact, to reverse it, given any group, there are lots of fundamental spaces for that group. And any one of them is a space, okay? Um, and that's what we tend to see. That's what our physics is always on about, okay? Um, so the theorem, uh, is, okay, I think I can do this in the time allotted. The invention of space theorem says that if a conscious agent's actions form a group, Okay, so I, I remember I said that G is not necessarily a group, but suppose it is actually a group. And suppose that the agent's perceptions are tuned to its actions in a certain way that I, I can describe afterwards if you ask me. Then the agent, uh, I forgot to mention one thing. The, the agent's perceptions are, are actually, a, uh, the, this group is a symmetry group for the perception space, okay? And I'll say that in the next slide. Then the agent will see that geometrical space for the group as if it's in the world. It's, it will it think that the world has that group structure. It has, the group is acting, that its own group of actions is actually acting on the world, even though the world need not have that structure. It's the agent that has a structure. Okay. Um, so, oh, sorry. I, I moved that just before you were about to photograph it. Here you go. I can send you my slides, though. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. In the sense of, of symmetries corresponding to conservation laws, physics already falls for this. Already falls for this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you turn the mirror there, right? Yeah. 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 yeah sure. I mean, I, that was one of the most important mathematical physics discoveries ever. Oh, yes. Um, so, uh, the fourth theorem, which I'm not even going to talk about any more uh, in any more detail, says that the, the, an observer, the observer, the conscious agent sees a probability structure in the world given by merely the probability structures in its own 
personal domain, X and G. Okay, There's a, the, if A and P are somehow attuned, then W doesn't have to have any probabilistic structure. You, the, the, you, you can impose one coming up from the observer. It's a pullback, really, in, in the sense. And um, the world may not have this structure. So, with all this evidence, we're going to propose that the traditional mind-body problem, which is that the physical causes consciousness, the physical world is fundamental, perhaps should be reversed. And we we'll call this the reverse mind-body problem. And in this, in this community, this is, this is the mind-body problem, and the other one is the reverse one. But anyway, <laughs> certainly from all the things we've been hearing so far. So consciousness is fundamental, and if consciousness is indeed fundamental, then what's the world? Well, here's the proposal, another thesis, another falsifiable thesis, is that the world consists of other conscious agents. It's conscious agents all the way down. Okay, little triangles everywhere. You know, it's like, <laughs> like uh, what is that movie, uh, Casablanca? Like triangles, triangles everywhere. Okay, so... Um, Instead of turtles all the way down. Well, triangular turtles. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so in the, in the remaining three minutes, I'm going to zoom through some slides about where this... I, I've basically given uh, or described a program of study, of work. And as with many other people here, we'd love to have young people get interested in this. The old fogies already know their physics. They're not interested, many of them. But many of them are, and their students are. So uh, what sort of things can we do with this? Well, or what should we try to do with this? The first thing I'm going to mention is that is the combination problem. How do how does do, do conscious modalities combine together to give rise to a new conscious modality? Um, <clears throat> it's a big problem, I'm told, in philosophy. Uh, then, given that the world consists of conscious agents, we'd like to be able to build circuits of conscious agents. And and Chris Fields was uh, led in this in, in a paper that was published in Cognitive Systems Research on this, as a first as a beginning towards building uh, circuits which which do things like uh, having memory, uh, performing predictive coding, etc., um, which is the sort of things that we want to be able to model in conscious perception. Um, just to flash a picture of one way in which you could put two conscious agents together. You know, so this is, this is actually a lovely picture because it says that within every conscious agent there can be a whole hierarchy of them all the way down. Hierarchical structure all the way down and, you know, where's the end? So the conscious realism thesis, I, I love, this is Don's term, conscious realism. It's, I think it's called idealism by lots of people, but, we, but he called it conscious realism, which I think is provocative and very, you know, accurate. That the world of any conscious agents is a circuit of conscious agents. Or it's simply one other conscious agent, given the previous picture, you can just think of it as one other conscious agent. Yes, sir. Network. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This is, and so network theory is the next step. Yeah, uh, informational network theory, yeah. or beyond that, perhaps. But at least the min at the minimum, informational network theory. Yes. Okay, so that's the main body of the talk. Um, you can um, form combinations by letting conscious agents interact with each other and looking at their asymptotic behavior, just like with Markov chains, and there are interesting things that happen with that. Um, okay, I'm waiting for the click. Is that a video? <laughs> okay. Um, Really what we need to be able to get to if we're going to make these claims is to show how space-time at least, let alone the rest of physics, emerges uh, from the interaction of conscious agents. And our belief is that this emerges as an efficient coding scheme. This is not something new to our group. It's something that physicists are thinking about. And uh, apparently have, there's a lot of work going on with that. Um, also, um, the... The, the, how do interfaces actually arise? Why should they? Why do we need them? 
Well, we need them to simplify our experience so that we can do something with it. Otherwise, it's overwhelming. And so we need some kind of massive compression from what's actually happening in this whole network of conscious agents to the, in, the interface that a particular conscious agent has. And so we have a way of doing this. Uh, we're working on a way of doing this using uh, geometric algebra, which is a very efficient way of doing vector analysis. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure the founders of geometric algebra would be horrified I just said that. But <laughs> vector analysis, who needs it? Um, that's what I learned in college. I learned, you know, Gibbs vector analysis. And then I found geometric algebra and I said, why, why didn't they teach us that? It's so beautiful. It's just much more efficient. It's nothing new, but it's much more efficient. Anyway, I'll skip these two slides. Just, they, they have to do with this compression mapping. And um, you can see the, the tremendous compression taking place. Yeah. In, Sorry, what's versus what here? Pardon? First thing on versus what? I didn't want to talk about it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is part of the question session, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, uh, the, there's the cardinality of the set of information operators, which is in blue. That's what's happening in the network. This is just a network of two agents. Okay, so in blue is the, the cardinality of how much information there is in the in the actual uh, world, and um, the the cardinality of the set of geometric algebra operators that are, that are encoding the information. This is a massive drop. I mean, in, uh, in, and, and this is assuming that each of the uh, agents has uh, got, say, p possible states in it. OK, a finite number of states. It's just uh, the very first stab at, at trying to uh, find good coding schemes. How, see how interfaces could possibly arise. Okay, so we need to also show how objects. What's an object? Why? why how do we identify objects? Um, and Chris has written many papers on this on this subject itself. Um, uh, how do they arise? in this context, and the idea is that they would arise as satisficing solutions to the fitness landscape. Objects have, uh, the, the objectification has, in, has fitness in a certain sense, okay? So we need to work on that. Is, is quantum theory somehow natural? Does quantum theory emerge in, uh, from conscious agent theory? Um, this is a whole other, I mean, this is a big subject for discussion. Um, and we have seen some things that look like quantum theory. Uh, we're not sure yet, OK? Um, though it is in, in the Objects of Consciousness paper that sort of started this section. Um, is physical law immutable as consciousness evolves? If consciousness is giving rise to physics on interfaces, then there's an evolution of consciousness. In fact, there's a lot of discussion of this in this, in this meeting. So does physical law itself change? And this physical law means human physical law. Our physics is human physics. Okay. Um, yesterday, or was it this morning, uh, Almas said that you know, the physical world is real. And we need to accept it as real. And I'm glad to accept it as real, those words to that effect. And I, I must say, I actually agree with him. It's just not necessarily what it, it's real to me. And it's important that I recognize its reality to me, because then I can, I can do things with it. I can enjoy it, for example. <laughs> OK, but that doesn't mean that it's an ultimate reality. OK. So then the question, the final question is, what drives the evolution of consciousness? OK. I think you put something up over there. I didn't see, sorry. <laughs> but I know I'm done. Oh, one minute. That's a lot of time. Well, what drives the evolution of consciousness? If indeed that is the basic thing that is evolving, that's, you know, this is even before biological evolution. This is something prior to that. Consciousness is evolving, biology is happening on our interface. And maybe the reflection of the evolution of consciousness is what we call biological evolution. 
Okay, so it looks very mechanical in one sense, you know, selection, and so forth, mutation, but perhaps it's not as mechanical as it actually looks. And so, what is it that would drive something like this? And here, um, I'm going to quote something I first heard from Federico Fagin, who's uh, you know supporting all this research and works with us. Uh, but then I heard it from Almas yesterday also. Uh, at least that's what I heard, and I think it's a wonderful place to end. The, what drives the evolution of consciousness is its urge and its need to know itself. And our physical worlds and our human bodies and our human experiences are the way, as Almas said, for consciousness to enjoy, to have sex, to discover mathematics, to do things which are really, really cool. Otherwise it can't. So. Ah, oh, I think I've finished. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so are there still questions? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm, I'm one of the slides where you showed the graph. Yeah. It looks like you're graphing P factor O to the P power versus P to the 16. And uh, maybe it's too much to ask, so where do those expressions come from? Uh, yeah, I, I hope I got those numbers right. One of them is the, uh, the, you have these two conscious agents and they have a state space, let's say x1, g1, x2, g2. So the perception space of the other one is the action space of, is the world for, for, the, for the first one and vice versa because they're interacting with solipsistic, not solipsistic, but very intimate relationship here. So the Markov dynamics is a dynamics which uh, is x1 cross g1 cross x2 cross g2. That's the state space for it. Okay, and then the taken as a whole, when you, when you compose the Markovian operators, you get a Markov dynamics. And so the, the, the total state space is that first quantity, the size of the state space. If each of them has, uh, has uh, uh, size p, then the total state space is given by uh, uh, that first quantity. I, and I'm, I, sh I should mention it's a little bit complicated by the fact that these guys have a memory of the previous state. So that's why it's that big. So this is how many biggest number of states that are available? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how many different number of states? And, and then the, the second quantity is the number of uh, uh, states which are encoded in a certain geometric algebra of a certain dimension. Which is much smaller. Go. Yeah. I, I do see some nice uh, synergies with some works in, in theoretic physics and Quantum mechanics with uh, quantum holographic quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. uh, a nice paper that comes to mind is uh, uh, Entanglement uses the geometry of space time. Uh, Who does? Entanglement. Oh. Uh, which is essentially this, this, I see it as, as this process of an agent becoming uh, uh, aware of something else. Is that that uh, paper by the Dutch fellow? Um, I don't remember who it was, sorry. Because, you know, yeah. it was arguing yeah. that the, you know, the holographic 2 plus 1 thing is incorrect because of entanglement from the boundary into the interior. The, uh, the expression I've heard, uh, like Arkadi Ahmed, for example, saying that space time is dead, which means that it's, it's an emergent property of deeper things like uh, entanglement. Yeah. And, uh, Entanglement, again, is something that is happening in these networks. Uh, it's not quantum entanglement, but, but their, their state spaces are getting entangled with each other in some way. And so that's, a, that's something to look, look at, definitely. Yeah. We would like to be able to construct space-time through the information network. Um, it, it would have to be under very strong constraints because not everything looks at space-time. I mean, you know, not every perception is a perception in space. But if we try to understand what kinds of perceptions are in space, then maybe we can uh, make a start, at least. The nice thing is you've got nothing to lose because you can't do any worse than the physical. 
You're, th that's beautiful. Right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's a great way to end it. <laughs>